Vaccines are very safe. If someone gets sick after vaccination, it is usually either a coincidence, an error in administering the vaccine, or very rarely a problem with the vaccine itself. That's why we have vaccine safety systems. Robust vaccine safety systems allow health workers and experts to react immediately to any problems that may arise. They can examine the problem rigorously and scientifically look at the data and then promptly address the problem. WHO works closely with countries to make sure that vaccines can do what they do best, prevent disease without risks. New vaccines against malaria, meningitis and encephalitis in Asia and Africa are now being thoroughly monitored with support from WHO. Vaccines are one of the safest tools we have to prevent disease and ensure a healthy future for all children. I think we cannot overemphasize the fact that, that we really don't have very good safety uh, monitoring systems in many countries and this adds to the miscommunication and the misapprehensions because we're not able to give clear-cut answers when people ask questions about the deaths that have occurred due to a particular vaccine and this always gets blown up in the media. Uh, one should be able to give uh, a, a very factual account of what exactly has happened and what the cause of deaths are but in most cases there's some obfuscation at that level and, and therefore there's uh, less and less trust then in, in, in the system. Putting in place the mechanisms, whether they're cohort studies or whether they're sentinel surveillance sites, to be able to, uh, to monitor uh, what's going on and report back and then for corrective action to be taken because unexpected things could arise uh, after introduction and one always has to be prepared. As we've seen you know, in the history of many drugs, you've, uh, you've heard about, I mean, learned about adverse events only after the drugs being licensed and introduced into the population. So I think that, that risk is all, all, always there and the population needs to understand that and, and feel confident that mechanisms are being put in place to, to study uh, some of those things. There's a lot of safety science that's needed. And um, without the good science, we can't have good communication. So although I'm talking about all these other contextual issues and communication issues, it absolutely needs the science as the backbone. You can't repurpose the same old science to make it sound better if you don't have the science that's relevant to the new problem. So we need much more investment in safety science. I think we cannot overemphasize the fact that, that we really don't have very good safety uh, monitoring systems in many countries and this adds to the miscommunication and the misapprehensions because we're not able to give clear-cut answers when people ask questions about the deaths that have occurred due to a particular vaccine, and this always gets blown up in the media, uh, one should be able to give uh, a, a very factual account of what exactly has happened and what the cause of deaths are. But in most cases, there's some obfuscation at that level, and, and therefore there's uh, less and less trust then in, in, in the system. Every time that there is an association, be it temporal or not temporal, the first accusation is it is the adjuvant and yet without adjuvants we are not going to have the next generation of vaccines and many of the vaccines that we do have ranging from tetanus through to HPV require adjuvants in order for them to work so the challenge that we have in front of us is how do we build confidence in this and the confidence first of all comes from the regulatory agencies I look to Marianne when we add an adjuvant it's because it is essential we do not add adjuvants to vaccines because we want to do so. But when we add them, it, in, it adds to the complexity. And I give courses every year on how do you develop vaccines, how do you make vaccines. And the first lesson is, while you're making your vaccine, if you can avoid using an adjuvant, please do so. Lesson two is, if you're going to use an adjuvant, use one that has a history of safety. And lesson three is, if you're not going to do that, 
think very carefully. It seems to me that adjuvants multiply the immunogenicity of the antigens that they are added to, and that is their intention. It seems to me they multiply the reactogenicity in many instances, and therefore it seems to me that it is not to unexpected if they multiply the incidence of adverse reactions that are associated with the antigen but may not have been detected through lack of statistical power in the original studies. You are correct. Um, as we add adjuvants, especially some of the more recent adjuvants, such as the ASO1 saponin derived adjuvants, we do see increased local reactogenicity. The primary concern, though, mo usually is systemic adverse events rather than local adverse events. And we, we tend to get in the phase two and the phase three studies quite good data on the local reactogenicity. Those of us in this room that are beyond the age of 50 who have had the pleasure of having the recent shingles vaccine will know that this does have quite significant local reactogenicity. If you got the vaccine, you know that you got the vaccine. Um, but this is not the major health concern. The major health concern which we are seeing are accusations of long-term long -term effects. So to come back to this, I'm going to once again point to the regulators. It comes down to um, ensuring that we, we conduct the phase two and the phase three studies with adequate size and with, the ad with appropriate measurement. So in our clinical trials, we're, we are actually using relatively small sample sizes. And when we do that, we're at risk of tyranny of small numbers, which is you just need a single case of Wegener's granulomatosis and your vaccine has to solve Walt's, how do you prove a null hypothesis? And it takes years and years to try to figure, to figure that out. So it's a real conundrum, right? Getting the right, the right size, dealing with the tyranny of small numbers, making sure that you can, can really do it. And so I think one of the, the things that we really need to invest in are kind of better biomarkers, better mechanistic understanding of how these things work so we can better understand um, adverse events as they come up. One of the additional issues that complicates safety evaluation is if you look at and you struggle with the length of follow-up that should be adequate in a, let's say, pre-licensure or even post-marketing study, if that's even possible. And again, as you mentioned, pre-licensure clinical trials may not be powered enough. It's also the subject population that you administer the adjuvant to, because we've seen data presented to us where an adjuvant, a particular adjuvant, added to a vaccine antigen did really nothing when administered to a certain population, and it's usually the elderly, you know, compared to, to administering the same formulation to, to younger age strata. So, so these are things which uh, need to be considered as well and further complicate safety and effectiveness evaluation of adjuvants combined with vaccine antigens. I cast back my mind to our situation in Nigeria, where at six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, a child is being given different antigens from different companies. And these vaccines have different adjuvants, different preservatives, and so on. Something crosses my mind. Is there a possibility of these adjuvants, preservatives, cross-reacting amongst themselves? Have there ever been a study on the possibility of cross-reactions from the panel members that you can share the experience with us. Now, the only way to tease that out is if you had a large population database like the Vaccine Safety Data Link, as well as some of the other um, national databases that are coming to being, where the actual vaccine exposure is tracked down to that level of specificity of who is the manufacturer, what is the lot number, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's uh, initiative to try to make the uh, vaccine label information uh, barcoded so that it includes that level of information so that in the future when we do these type of studies, we're able to uh, tease that out. <clears throat> and, and in order to, be, 
to, as you, each time you subdivide, then the uh, sample size gets becoming more and more challenging. And that's what I said earlier today about that we're really only in the beginning of the era of large data sets where hopefully you could start to um, kind of uh, harmonize the databases for multiple studies. Uh, and there's actually an uh, initiative underway. Uh, Helen there uh, uh, may want to comment on it to try to get more national uh, vaccine safety database uh, linked together so we could start to answer these type of questions that you just raised. The other thing that's a trend and an issue is not just confidence in providers, but confidence of healthcare providers. We have a very wobbly health professional front line that is starting to question vaccines and the safety of vaccines. When the front line uh, professionals are starting to question or they don't feel like they have enough confidence about the safety to stand up to it to the person asking them the questions. I mean, most medical school curriculums, even nursing curriculums, I mean, in medical school, you're lucky if you have a half day on vaccines, never mind keeping up to date with all this. <laughs>